with the boy writing an autobiography, I dread to think how ad hominem it's going to be, how much he's going to slam the people, and that's it. You think, um, how old is Katie Board now? I think by now he would be in his 50s. Is that all, 50s? Maybe late 50s. Huh. Maybe 60. He's not more than 60. Wait, he said he was born in 1931. That would make him roughly about 60, wouldn't it? Mm. Or 61 or 62. Mm. Yes. But, uh, by the way, he's now very negative. He came out with comments on the theory. He commented on himself. Well, he published a new work. Yeah, it's a new work called Comments on the Theory of the Spectacle, mm -hmm. in which he came out. My recollection, if you could read that very strange style, they they are crazy about how they're translated. It's very funny. A wonderful translation of their work was done, which many of you are reading now, by a man called Freddie Perlman, who was enamored of them for a time. And he translated the theory of the spectacle into English, and he did a beautiful job, exquisite. But because they had not supervised it, they condemned it. They condemned it. And believe it or not, and this is the absurdity of the situation, one of their people put up posters, as they used to do in Paris, in New York. Where? In the Lower East Side. You know who lives in the Lower East Side of New York? Blacks and Puerto Ricans. And in their garbled English, which consists of a literal translation of the French, which you can't do, they told Puerto Ricans who never heard of situationism, <laughs> and blacks who wouldn't even go near it with a 10-foot pole, denouncing this new book, which blacks and Puerto Ricans are as likely to see as I am to see the, ride, the rings of Jupiter or ride on them. So it was silly. They, they, they stood to the juvenile at times, which was really quite absurd. <clears throat> it's quite funny, because in their writing, they quite often talk about niggledly, niggledly no, I can't say that, they niggledliness. Talk about, uh, Niggledeenus. Niggledeenus. Niggledeenus? Is it in the English that. translation? Well, niggle, to be niggly is <laughs> no, no, to be... Uh, annoying. It's sort of, it's to be like this all the time and, you know, kind of poking and aggravating uh -huh. and okay. it's more like childish behaviour. Well, they put up a statue of Charles Fourier, a bust, mm. in one of the neighbourhoods to see what would happen. That was the situation. But uh, they were not at all... You see, a, a myth has grown up that they were in the forefront of 68, they were not. Yeah. Undoubtedly, there were people who were influenced by them, and Danny Cohn Bendit, who has since now become a social democrat for all practical purposes, he's no longer Danny the Red of 68, you know. No son too in Zidabla, that famous poster of him. Well, Danny is now a Rialo and works in the government, uh, in the uh, Frankfurt government, in charge of. Uh, emigres, you know, people who are not emigres, people who are uh, refugees. Mm. And uh, Danny, in a book which I think was mainly written by his brother, called, you know, Left Wing Communism, something or other. Uh, a book that became characteristic of 68, although it was not, uh, cites them and cites particularly the poverty of student life as being very important. But uh, I know a good deal about the poverty of student life pamphlet and all the shenanigans that went on with the student funds. You see, that was a crisis that occurred <laughs> with where did the money go? <laughs> all right. If you read that pamphlet, you'll see that a lot of it had to do with where did the money go? And uh, that's a mixed bag that I would have to go back to files and memories to find out where the money went. <laughs> <laughs> but in the course of doing so, of course, they made their critique of education. Life is boring. But I don't know that you can jump from one stone to another in the name of situationism to make life ecstatic. I don't think you can live on a level of everyday ecstasy. That would become boring. It would be like eating too much caviar and drinking too much champagne for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Life has to have these variations. It has to have its sorrows, and it has to have its monotonous moments, it has to have its routines. Otherwise, the idea of the enjoyable, the 
of pleasure and freedom are not visible. They don't have any definition anymore. They are partly defined by certain contrasts. There are routine things that we have to do which make it all the more enjoyable to do, shall we say, the ecstatic or engage in the ecstatic experience, engage in ecstatic experiences. So I think that there's a good deal of juvenility in that type of mentality, that life must be one ongoing ecstasy. Just let me, let make it, in, it's enough to make life artistic, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not an ongoing ecstasy. It would get tiring if it became <laughs> nothing but an ongoing ecstasy for the very simple reason that it would be quite impossible to know what ecstasy is. <laughs> You'd have to spend a lot of time trying to... It's like having one ongoing... Yes. It's like having one ongoing orgasm. <laughs> What's so wonderful about an ongoing orgasm? Well, then you'd be waiting for the end, continuously. You'd get disgusted with it. <laughs> yes. Mm, or you'd want it to stop for a moment. Yeah. That would then become... That feeds into the question of work and toil and all the rest of that. Yeah. There have to be moments when one has to confront routine activities and responsibilities to make other forms of activity, creative work, creative. And what lies behind creativity, which as Goethe so very well understood, are the hard, painful, onerous tasks of preparing. Beethoven's symphonies and sonatas were not composed just spontaneously. This man worked and labored on his material until he produced these masterpieces. And that's the thing that we're losing today. We're losing the idea that behind every work that is truly marvelous, the merveilleux, as the surrealists used to put it, behind that lies the routine activity of preparing a canvas. You know, if you want to speak of painting as a case in point, preparing the paints, organizing the palette, and laboring carefully to finally produce that exquisite work, which we call a work of art. Similarly, music, the pain of working and toiling and reorganizing and bringing mind as well as sensibility to bear on a symphony as magnificent as the fifth, which starts with only a few notes, da 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 da, and then goes through this masterful variation of this. That is hard work. But it is hard work that is inspired and that ultimately leads to an aesthetic masterpiece. And so I don't believe in living entirely all the time on the level of le merveilleux, the marvelous, the ongoing orgasm. The pure moment of all nothing but pleasure. On the other hand, work can become miserable. That's another story. And that's what we want to get out of work. That's when we get from work into toil. We get from freedom into necessity.